morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. Good to have you guys here this morning. I know we still have a few coming in. Uh, we're going to get started with class. As you came in the door, hopefully everybody grabbed their uh, Kingston Weekly with some of the updates that we have and some new information we've put in there. A few things to point out to you this morning. First of all, we want to again uh, promote and encourage our women about the Ladies' Day coming up this Saturday. Uh, it's going to be a great event for everyone. I know Della said they've already got about 38 already registered of ladies, so that's great. And uh, maybe get a few more to that number throughout this week. But don't forget that that's coming up this weekend. Uh, so make your plans. The theme is Esther a a su for such a time as this. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had our men's breakfast. Had about 12 of us, 12 or 13 of us that were there. And Sean cooked a great breakfast for us. And so it was really good. Um, and we had a, a great time together. We're going to try to do that once a month. And so the next one coming up is uh, March 27th. I think that's the date, the, that last Saturday of March. We'll be doing another men's breakfast, so put that on your calendar as well. Uh, a few uh, updates on some of our sick. I know if you look in the back, you'll see announcements. We have a lot of people on our prayer list, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, as far as Jackson goes, uh, an update for him. You see uh, Elizabeth had uh, posted this message to everyone about them coming home, but they are home. Uh, Jackson is at home right now, still dealing with some pain, but they're trying to treat that, and the doctors are still looking at, uh, at ways that they can help uh, him with some of the issues that he has, and hopefully uh, they'll continue to do that, and he can make a, a full recovery, but I know he still, still has a way to go. We keep praying for him, but they're, they're glad to be home and uh, glad to be in their own house. Um, also, if you notice at the back... Uh, of the Kingston Weekly, you'll see the highlighted areas. Uh, Larry and Evelyn Landis moving back to Ohio and their new address is in the directory now, as well as Jacob K. Wood has a new address in the directory. Anything else we need to, to remember or add to this that we might have uh, overlooked or not known about when we print these out? Okay. Well, let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll start with our class this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for giving us this time to come together and to worship with you and, and to spend time as a family studying from your word. Lord, thank you for uh, all those that, that are part of this congregation. Lord, we pray that you work within their lives and and in their hearts right now as they are uh, continually try to seek after you and to study, to, to learn, and to grow in their knowledge, uh, but also in the relationship with you. Lord, we're thankful for this church. And <clears throat> excuse me. We're thankful for you know, all that you do for us and how you bless our lives every day. Lord, even in difficult situations, we are uh, extremely thankful that we can still have hope and joy and trust in you Lord, we pray that we always continue to do that. Lord, as we mentioned this morning, we have a lot of things that uh, we are looking forward to that are coming up, especially the Ladies' Day that's coming up this Saturday. We pray that you be with this event, be with Adele and all those who are helping plan for it right now and are, are working on it. Lord, be with their efforts and be with all those who are going. That Lord, this will be a wonderful day of, of praise and worship and fellowship and great spiritual growth. Lord, we pray that you be with uh, our class this morning as we study, continue to study out of Genesis. That, Lord, you be with uh, our hearts and our minds as we look at these words and, and not just learn and, and grow from, from the history and the message there, but, Lord, really take it to heart and, and look at ways that we can use what we learn to make us better in our lives. Lord, we pray for those that are, that are sick, that are hurting right now because of illness, physical illness, spiritual illness. But we ask that you lift them up and you heal them. You, you work within their hearts and minds and, uh, and give them the strength 
that they need, the encouragement that they need and support. Lord, help us again as a church family to always uh, seek after serving and reaching out to those who are hurting and who are lost. Lord, bless this congregation. Help us to do great things through you. Lord, it's our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning we're going to continue studying out of Genesis. You have your handouts. We're talking about conflict and covenant this morning. The tests of faith. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 14 to 15. Last week we, we got into the start of God's covenant of promise with man through his servant Abraham. And we call this the second part, part two, the, the emergence of Israel. The emergence of Israel. Last week, what were some of the things we talked about as far as Abraham, if you remember? What were some things we brought up uh, about him and about who he was? Okay, he was, he was deceitful about his wife. Uh, let me back so you guys can. <laughs> uh, he was deceitful about his wife. Why was he deceitful about his wife? He was afraid he'd be killed. Okay, he was afraid for his own life, right? Uh, so what else about Abraham? Who called him? The Lord, and what did God call him to do? To go into a strange land. Yeah, to just go. Go into a land that I'm going to show you. You have no idea where you're going. And so last week we talked a little bit about uh, you know, having, having God call us to a place like that. We've all had to move, or, or many of us have had to move somewhere. Uh, but usually when we're, we're, we're called up to move, whether it's military, whether it's your job, whatever, they're usually going to tell you, okay, here's where you're going. Uh, that was a little different with Abraham. God just said, I'll, I'll show you, you just go. And he, he packed up everything he had, and he went. Uh, and he took his family with him. He took uh, uh, some relatives with him, and they, they took off. And that took a great bit of faith. And we talked about how Abraham is known for his faith, but he still, as a man, had struggles. Uh, he still had times when his faith wasn't as strong. It wasn't as, um, as big as we, we like to think of Abraham as being, as, as this giant of faith, which he was, but he still had struggles. Does that help us relate a little bit better with Abraham? It should. You know, it should help us relate a little better with Abraham and understand that even great men in the Bible, think about all these great men in the Bible that we study and talk about. Uh, they're, they're highlighted for a lot of great things they've done, but almost every one of them that I can think of, with the exception of Jesus Christ himself, you also see bits and pieces of their life that wasn't so great. I think God really does that on purpose to show us those things. Uh, to, to one, let us realize that even, even these men of God were imperfect people, and they weren't perfect and they had their flaws. What were some of the flaws that we talked about Abraham? We talked about he was deceitful. He lied about his wife because he was, he was fearful. What are some other things we know about Abraham where his faith wasn't as strong? A little bit later we know that God promised him a son, but he took it upon himself to bear the help to do his own thing to have a son. Okay, yeah. Uh, the the time when he, uh, he's this great man of faith who moved his family when God told him to. And there's other times we see where he had this great faith. But there were the times at lack when God promised him that he was going to give him a son. And because Sarah and him worried about their age, they lost that faith and trust in him and started taking it into their own hands. And what happens when you take, uh, you take what God's promised and you take that into your own hands to try to accomplish something that God said he's going to do for you? What tends to happen with that? It didn't turn out too well. No, it usually doesn't turn out too well. <laughs> uh, I think that's another thing you learn about your own life is when you try to take things in your own hands, it 
and do it yourself without God's help, I tend to mess it up quite a bit. Those are the times I, I, I stop and look back at it and go, man, what was I thinking? You know, why did I do that? And so we see that Abraham was not uh, always this man of great faith at all times. He had his ups and downs. He had his struggles. But overall, he really did trust God. And one thing you see about Abraham is he comes back to constantly, uh, when he does have those moments, he comes back and repents of them. And he, he, he makes it right, and then you see his faith grow even stronger. And I think it's important to point out. So this morning as we get into uh, to chapter 14, we're going to see more about uh, Abraham's faith and his covenant uh, with God. And so let's look, starting in, in chapter 14, verse 1. In the days of Amraphil, king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Elazar, Chedor Lamar, king of Elam, and Tadel, king of Goam. Don't you love these? I mean, these. I probably did, but it's okay. Uh, y- you can read it for yourself, right? Uh, these, these names are great. These kings made war with Bari, uh, Barak, king of Saddam. Bersha, king of Gomar, Shineb, king of Edmah, Shemibar, king of Zobim, and, and, and king, and king, and king, okay? Uh, and all these joined forces in the valley of Sidium, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served uh, Chedar Lamar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated Raham and Estor, Karnam and Zuzum and Ham, uh, the Imim, and I'm going to just kind of go skip this part because <laughs> they, they tongue tie it. The idea is what's happening here is you've got all these, these kings and nations. Now the kings at this time uh, from what I understand of it when reading it and kind of looking at some of the history, uh, we think of kingdoms as being great country areas, big, large areas. Well, this time, from what I understand, is it wasn't, wasn't that big of an area. Uh, these were more of almost like city, small state dwellings. And you had a king here, a king here, a king here, and they kind of controlled that region. Uh, well, for a while there had been peace, but now they're warring with each other, and they're fighting uh, against, you have, uh, you have these kings siding with these kings and going together to fight these kings to try to increase territory and, uh, and of course, wealth that comes with the land that they're trying to overcome. So the, the peace is not there anymore. Um, in verse 8, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomar, and the king of Edmah, uh, the king of Zobium, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, they went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim. Uh, and so now they're battling. You look at verse 10. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. So what's, what's happening now with the, the battle? What's going on? It's getting personal to Abraham. Abraham's kind of just been doing his thing, has his, his land. But uh, also, you've got to remember in chapter 13, what happened between Abraham and Lot? I know we, we've skipped over that chapter, but from what we know, of Scripture, what has happened with Abraham and Lot? Yeah. Yeah, they were having a problem keeping it separate. God had blessed both of them. They both had uh, grain, gained a lot of wealth, and again, through wealth, meaning a lot of, uh, a lot of livestock and, and servants and stuff, and they had all this going on, and had grown with all these things, and their servants were starting to bicker over whose is what, and, and it was, the area they were in was just getting too big for both of them. And instead of fighting with each other, Abraham tells Lot, look, 
let's just go our separate ways. You take your stock and your servants. You go your way and I'll go mine. Now I'll let you pick which land. And where did Lot decide to pick? He, he picked the best land. He's like, well, this is really fertile here. I'm going to go over here. And so he does. Uh, as kind of a side note, it is interesting when you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah even. Um, at first you have Lot just talk about sin and how it can work within your life. Is it's interesting as we go through Genesis, you have, you have Lot in the fields with his servants and his livestock. He chooses the fertile ground that looks better. Abraham goes a different direction. Lot goes in <clears throat> close to where Sodom and Gomorrah is at. And when you first see him, he's, he's outside in the area. Uh, so he gets captured in this part of the text. Later on, though, after this, uh, you see him at the gates. And then he's inside the city. <laughs> so uh, he's a part of the city itself that's, that's so evil and so full of... Uh, of to everything detestable to God that it's about to be destroyed, they has to be rescued again from the city. So it's just a, something we can learn about. You, you look at something that you like, and the closer you get to it, the more you get wrapped in it, and it's harder to, get, to flee it. Uh, but at this point, Lot and Abraham have separated. Lot has gone his way, and Lot is uh, in, these, in this area where these kings are battling, Right? And it says, so the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah. They, uh, they, they've conquered this area and they're taking the possessions. Well, here you got Lot with all his servants and all his livestock in this well. So they take him too. He gets pulled into it and taken away. Uh, then one who had escaped, verse 13, came and told Abraham the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamir the Amorite, brother of Ushkal and of Enar. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinmanship had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen, Lot, with his possessions, and the women and the people. So, uh, think about this for a minute. Abram has to go and rescue Lot. What does he do? He, he takes what? Who does he take with him? Trained men. Many years I've just kind of read and looked over that. What does it mean, trained men? <laughs> That's what I, that was kind of my, my mental picture was trained men. These are guys that, these are the guys within his group that trained. Well, that that kind of tells me that he had his own army. And then I started thinking, well, if he had all these possessions and things, he probably did have a group of men that were uh, to help guard and that, that would train for conflict and battles and things to happen. So he was prepared. He had some people with him, and so he took 318 of them, and then they pursue as far as Dan, and they go back, and they find where Lot is and those who kept him, and they, and they bring them back. Uh, they go up against them, and they defeat them, and they bring the, the, the possessions and Lot and his, his, the, the women and the people back, and they save them. Uh, so verse 17 of 14. After, the, after his return from the de defeat, uh, of Tordelon and the king, I say that different every time, by the way, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of, Sodom, king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten 
and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anar, Eshkol, and Memory take their share. So now you have the king's blessing, Abram. He's, again, uh, you see God's hand kind of working with him that he continues to get blessed. Uh, but Abram does something very interesting here. He, he decides not to take something from the king. Uh, why? Well, because he doesn't want the king to have credit for what he's done. He wants God to have the credit. So, so let's look at your handout for a minute. We, we talk yeah, about this. Yeah. In the verse 18, mm-hmm. this is one of the most interesting mysterious characters in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Israel. Yeah. Yeah. But Melchizedek is brought back up in Hebrews mm-hmm. and says that Jesus is like Melchizedek. Right. He's a very interesting mysterious character. Yeah. Because we don't hear very much, we don't hear anything more about him a little bit in Psalms or, uh, or Hebrews. Right. But Hebrews really mentions him quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think, I think there are others who still worship God other than the Jews, and, and, and it, it makes sense, too, because they all came from Noah, and Abram is even descendant of Seth, through Seth's descent, and we see that God is blessing the people that will soon become the people of Israel through Abram, so that even, hadn't even happened yet. So at this point, you still have those who are, who are fearful of God and, and praise God, so I believe, yeah, I think you, this is an example where you see Mm-hmm. What were they chosen for? To bring Christ into the world. Right. So there were other people around who may still worship God in the right way. Yeah. And you can't just rule them out. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that there's something innately built into us at birth and part of our human nature to know or to believe in something greater than ourselves and higher than ourselves. Uh, that's why I think you look at even other cultures outside of, of at, even at this time, you, you look at the Greek culture and, and their creation of many different gods and something. You look at even uh, those within Native American history uh, that they, they would make gods out of something because there's something in us that wants to worship something greater than us uh, innately. I, I really believe that about our human nature because I think God put that in us. Uh, so, at this time, I still think that there are many uh, that have come off of the descendants uh, of Noah that, that believe in God and have, have followed and trusted in God. And again, Abram is still part of that because uh, Isaac uh, is his son who's going to be born. He's, he's going to bless Abram through his descendants, which become the children of Israel. So that's still coming down the road. So at this point, there are many others who... Uh, who I believe continue to, to have us faith and trust in God. And Melchizedek is one of those characters that he, he is mysterious in a way. But you see through this writing that it is pointed out that he was king of Salem, but he was priest of God Most High. That, that's something that people knew him as. So, yeah, I think it's a good point. It says, Jesus, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Right. 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 Exactly. All right. So let's look at um, our handout here because we're, we're talking about this, this chapter. If you look at the, the top part, it says, if you want your faith to increase, don't be surprised or disheartened over difficulties which demand faith. The muscles of faith grow strong through training and testing that is sometimes painful. Abram continues to learn his lesson after parting from his nephew Lot. In this study, we see Abram's trial and the resources God provides to help him meet the challenge and persevere. First of all, do you agree with that that statement? The muscles of faith grow strong through training and testing that is sometimes painful. Is that a true statement? Yes. Why, Why would we say that it's a true statement? 
Give me some thoughts on that. There you go. It wouldn't be a strong muscle if you didn't use it and work it, right? Uh, if, uh, if you don't use your muscles, what happens to them? They shrink. They deteriorate. Uh, they, when you don't use certain muscles, uh, they, they become weaker. You're, we've all realized that. You ever done something you haven't done since you were a younger person and, you know, I remember, it's been a little while ago, getting on a bike after not being on a bike for a while and going riding. Felt pretty good until the next morning. My muscles were screaming at me. They're like, you hadn't done that in a while. I had certain muscles that I'd forgotten about, right? Oh, well, why? Because I don't use those muscles. Uh, the, so if you don't use a muscle, you don't, you don't work at training, it gets weaker. And I think our faith is the same way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I like that. Yeah. The, the church in Acts seems like the persecution, the more that they had to rely on their faith and trust, the stronger, more powerful the church was. I, I think that's a, could be a warning for us today that sometimes the more we, more we get comfortable with, you know, we like to say, well, we're so glad we live in a country where there's no persecution. Well, I'm going to tell you, I have a feeling that's that's going to change a little bit. You already see that changing, but we get too comfortable. Then what's happened over the last few years? Well, we've had churches that haven't grown. They've been shrinking. It, but it seems like every time there's, there's a persecution or challenge, the church rises and becomes stronger and, and, and harder at work. So that's a good point. And I think that's the same thing with our faith and same thing with Abram. Uh, th- these challenges helped him grow stronger through his training and testing. Uh, and for us, we, we need to remember that. So look at number one, read, well, reading through Genesis 14 like we just did. What political and military situation is described here in Genesis chapter 14? What? Yeah. Yeah. And these are people that used to get along. And now they fight and, and struggle with each other, don't they? And, and it's they're, they're battling each other for land and power uh, and wealth. Is this similar to anything we see today? No. Not at all, right? We don't see this at all. Uh, yeah, I, I think we see this all the time. I like think we, we see it in our own country right now. Uh, we see it around the world, the, the people that fight and have war with each other you know, because of, uh, of the material wealth they want from another country or from another person. And uh, we, we see these battles. And so this is what's going on. Um, and so when we look at the question two, describe the battle and its results for Lot and his family, what do we say about that? What is, what's happened here? This battle's happened. A uh, battle has happened. What's happened with Lot? Yeah, he's mixed up in there. It's mixed up all together. He gets captured. He gets taken off. And since Abram lived in tents away from the cities, he was able to be uh, kind of off the side and, and not get involved in it, and, and this military campaign. But again, Lot, he chose... Uh, the better ground that was close to Sodom and Gomorrah, so there was the city and the, and the things going on. Well, that was the hotbed of what these other armies wanted. And he's right in the middle of it. Uh, so in some ways, Abram, by, by letting him do that and taking uh, the not-so-fertile ground and kind of being off, he stayed away from it. And so then Lot gets captured uh, and, and taken off. And so when he learns, when Abram learns of Lot's capture, what are some of the strategies he's, he devises against uh, going against them? Yeah, he was smart in the fact he didn't just take a bunch of guys and say, hey, whoever wants to go with me, right? Uh, he, he says, I will take my trained men, which, again, that trained means they, they must be spending time 
preparing for battles and things like this uh, with the foresight that th this could happen. So he takes them, he goes out, and he, he, he pursues uh, these armies that have taken Lot and his family, and he goes up against them and brings them back, and, and all the women and the children and the people with him and the possessions, he, he rescues them. So, Yeah. Into different groups to attack in different places. Yeah. He didn't just go out and muscle his way in. He used some strategy. Right. He, he, he used some, uh, some mental, uh, he had the mental fortitude to, to divide them up and to, to have some strategy to it. Uh, he had some planning to it. Uh, so I guess you could say, really, this is probably the, the first example we have of a special forces is found in the Bible, right? <laughs> uh, Bill. It seems like they may have traveled as much as 150 miles. Yeah. Yeah. On camels. On camels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever they had, I tell you what they had, they had God on their side too. And that's something else that we, we have to point out that uh, Abram goes out with his trained men, he's got that mindset, but I think God is really working in him to help him uh, strategize and, and to go against them and, and he, he does, he brings them back and because of it God is able to uh, Abram is able to be blessed by God through even that um, and even by the people that see it what else do you think this does for all those around as far as Abram goes what about these other kingdoms now yeah it's got a yeah yeah. Now they're like, oh, hey, let's not, let's not mess with Abram. Uh, so it, it, it gives him a boost of who he is. And so if he's God's man, he's given God the glory, which again we see the question for is who is Melchizedek and what does he do? Well, he goes out. He's the high priest, God's most high priest, who's also the king of Salem. He goes out and meets him. He, he gives some recognition of Abraham. And Yeah. And he's king of Salem, which later on becomes Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. so right. A very important town for the Jews. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. It becomes Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, so he is, it's an important place. And here you have the king coming out, who's also God's high priest, most high, and he blesses Abram. That's got to be a, a really good mark for everybody else to know. So this guy's blessed by God, uh, and it shows. Um, so that second part, how does his blessing help Abram put this victory in proper perspective? What do you think? How does it help him put it in proper perspective? Yeah, yeah, verse 20, uh, it talks about bless God most high who has deli who's delivered your enemies into your hand, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So the king of Salem said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. And so it gives Abram even an opportunity there to say, no, uh, I, don't, I don't want to take anything from you other than what just the food that you've given us and what these guys need as their percentage because I don't want anybody to say that you as the king made me rich. Wait a minute. Now, my Bible says in verse 21 it changes the person. This is now the kingdom of Sodom. Yes, it is. Rather than Melchizedek. Right, it's not Melchizedek. This is the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom. Right. He's also come out, but it, but it yeah, I'm sorry, that I, sh I should have referenced that. But yeah, now the king of Sodom is trying to give Abram, and, and again, it gives, it gives Abram the opportunity, as he did with, uh, with Melchizedek, to say, I don't want people to think that you're the one who's making me rich. I want people to know it's God. He puts it back on God. He's giving God the credit. 
and God the glory for it, which is a, a great move on his part because it, again, proves to us and shows us what? That Abram is a man of faith and trust in God, and that's who he wants to give the credit because he knows that it's through God that his God has blessed him. Uh, he, he, he doesn't take the credit, even for the, even for the victory, for his strategic mind or his ability to go out and conquer. He, he gives God that glory. Uh, that shows, again, his faith in, in understanding who he was. Uh, and so, again, again, for question six, what evidence do we find of Abram's growing confidence in God? That's it, isn't it? That he, he doesn't, he doesn't want to take the credit or glory away from God. So, uh, let's look at, uh, let's move on into chapter 15, because here's where we get uh, the covenant God's covenant with Abram after this. Uh, verse, uh, verse 1, After these things, the word, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So all this has happened, and so God comes in with this vision, and he tells him, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and remember my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So let's, let's look at that for a minute. What, what is Abraham's main problem at this point? He doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have an heir. Why is that important? Yeah, person in his household. Uh, if, you do, if you don't have a son, which, by the way, that's how, during this time, especially, it, it, life hasn't really changed that much, but at this time, uh, if you didn't have a son to pass in the air, it would go to somebody else in your household. So a son was very important for the, the wealth that you had and the servants and all of the, the things that you possessed, that would go to your son. Now, if you had more than one son, who did it go to? Went to the older one, the firstborn, right? That's why we see some of that play out later in Genesis 2, an issue with that. But he didn't have anybody. What, is it, what do we also know at this point? Why is he worried about this at this point? He has 300 men. <laughs> we know he has at least 318 powerful men and, and plus. Uh, plus all the servants and everything, but... What, why, why is he concerned about this? Is he a young guy? Is Sarah young? No, he's already up in age. You know, and it takes several more years after this before he actually gets a son. But he, so he's, he's like, you know, I, I'm, what else can you give me? I don't, God, you keep blessing me with all this wealth, but what good is it? It's just going to go to somebody else. It doesn't go to my family because I don't have an heir. Uh, so he's concerned for that reason. Uh, and what does God tell him? What does God say to him? He says, don't, don't worry about it. Matter of fact, he tells him to go outside, doesn't he? Now, I, I, th I think of this passage a lot. Uh, almost every, seriously, almost every time I go outside on a, on a clear night and you can see all kind of stars, uh, it's incredible, and I, I always think about, man, I think about how God promised Abraham that he'll have descendants uh, as innumerable as the stars, because you do, you sit and you go, that's a lot, that's a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I was at the third darkest place in the country last year, and they have a, where you go out and look at the stars at night. Yeah. You see the Milky Way, and all those. Yeah. Not in Utah. Yeah. 
I, I, I had a, a similar experience not the darkest place, but one of the things I noticed was the higher up in elevation you get, the more stars you can see, especially when you're away from things. And, and I shared not too long ago about going and climbing Mount Kenya. And that was one of the things that was amazing to me, in just that whole experience is being 16,000 feet up in elevation on the equator. So you're like on the fattest part of the earth, 16,000 feet up in, in the sky. And that was one thing I noticed was I had never seen so many stars in my life. You think you see a lot of stars now, but you get up that high and you're above most of the cloud coverage and anything. You look up and it's just stars everywhere. It was incredible. And to think that that's the promise that he's making, God is saying, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, because your offspring is going to be forever. And it's going to be as numerous as the stars. You, you can't count the stars. That's, that's how it's going to be for you. So God is making this promise here to Abram. That, that he's going to give him an offspring. And Abram laughs about that, right? Abram laughs about it. Oh, it was Sarah. Yeah, Abram doesn't laugh about it, does he? Matter of fact, what does it say about Abram's reaction to this word, uh, to the word that God, the words that God gives him? Yeah, well, yeah, he doesn't have any, but, but what does he say when God says, I'm going to give you an offspring, and I'm going to give you, through this offspring, there's going to be so many descendants that I'm going to bless you with, that they're as numerous as the stars. Uh, you tested him. Okay, look at verse 6, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It says, talk about, again, she point out his faith. It says, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Abram believes what, the, what God has said. It shows his faith again. He believes what he says, and he says, I'm going to count it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you the land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat, three years old, and a ram, three years old. A turtle dove and a young pigeon, and he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Uh, and so as we go on from this, we see that, that God is going to, to give him a sign because God says, I'm also going to give you a land. What, are we, what, what is God starting here? We're going, to, we're going to end with this part. So through Abram, God is promising Abram two things, isn't he? What two things? Yeah, descendants in a land. What, what, is he, what is he starting? Huh? A nation. He's starting a nation, and, he, and, he, and he's promising. He's making a covenant with Abram right now. And this is where we see him, him laying it down, saying, I'm going to give you a land, which we, we know is Canaan, Israel, <laughs> and I'm going to give you descendants through a son, which we know is going to become Isaac, who then Jacob, and, and through his descendants, there's going to become the nation of Israel, which becomes uh, the, the descendants of through which Jesus Christ will come. So this is the covenant God's making with him, and, and Abram believes it and counts his righteousness. Okay, so uh, any, any other comments anybody wants to make about this so far or is, from what we're studying? All right, well, I've got time for class to be over and get ready for worship, so... Thank you guys again for all your comments, and we'll uh, start back up with worship in about 15 minutes.
from Kingston Church. Glad everybody can make it this morning. At least the rain, it's not raining right now, so that's a good sign. We can all get home hopefully before it starts raining again. Got a few announcements. Uh, the biggest next Saturday is the Ladies' Day. Please see uh, Della and let her know what you plan on eating because she's got to turn that order in. It's from 9 to 3 on Saturday. Jackson is home. I uh, hadn't got to talk to him, but said he's doing a little better. It's just day by day, so keep praying for him and the Igo family. On that note, Morgan got a internship. I think it's to London from Fashion Weekly, so she'll be going to, I don't know if it's in the fall or over the summer. May. May? It's in May, so she goes in May. So that's awesome for her and the family, so. On that note, my wonderful daughter in the back doing the slides, she got accepted to UT's program, so she starts in the fall. Uh, and she couldn't get all the praise, so Nash called, and he got accepted to King's College. He's starting back to get his. He had to you know, step on her parade the same day, so that's, that's my son for you, you know. Um, children's Church. Uh, children's classes, we have no, uh, nobody that's over that right now. So we need volunteers to teach everything. So if you're willing to volunteer, please let me know. As kids start coming back, we'll start plugging you in. Um, a lot of times you might be on standby until we have kids. So we need to fill, out, fill the children's church. The way Dana was doing it was trying to do it uh, four times a year and break you up about every three months you would have to do it. So please, if you're still willing to do it, please let me know so we can start working on that because we're starting to get a few kids back. So Larry and Evelyn's here. They're, they've moved one load up. They're back here for a couple weeks. Then they'll move the big load up. So their new address is in the directory. Also Jacob's uh, address is in the directory of Kwood. So reach out to them. Last thing, if you would like to learn how to sing lead singing, please see John or myself so we can try to get you plugged in with Brent or Randy or one of them. Um, we have a volunteer from West End come in, Elliot Jones. He's gonna fill in today, so uh, he picked out the songs for us and just uh, let's sing with him and get ready for church. Did, did I miss anything? Okay, Ellie, it's all yours. Look. I had the opportunity of meeting several of you, and I just wanted to say thank you for the warm welcome. I believe it's Carly. You got accepted to UT. As a fellow UT student, I have the authority to say congratulations and bless your heart. <laughs> but congratulations. <laughs> We'll start this morning with number 508, A Wonderful Savior. <clears throat> a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. Salvation is wonderful love, I'll shout 
with millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and God was me there with his hand, and God was me there with his hand. And for our scripture reading and prayer, we'll sing be with me, Lord. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for another day today. Thank you for blessing each of us with life and health. We're thankful that we can gather here this morning in your name and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, as we come before you this morning, we ask that you'll forgive us of our sins. Help us to recognize the the sins that we commit. Help us to dedicate ourselves more faithfully to you each day that you give us. Father, we're thankful for our elders here, thankful for Bill and Leon, and just pray that you'll bless them with wisdom, pray that you'll guide them as they shepherd us here. Thankful for John and and his ministry here, pray that you'll be with him this morning as he brings another lesson from your word. Father, we're mindful of those of our friends and family who are sick, and we're especially mindful of Jackson. Pray for a special blessing on him for healing. Pray that you'll give him strength, and we pray that you'll be with the doctors and who are overseeing his care, and pray that you'll give them the wisdom they need to bring him the treatment that he needs. Father, we're thankful for this great country we live in and the freedom and the peace that we enjoy each day. And we just pray that we can continue to be a nation that looks to you, even though it seems like many don't. We know that many don't. But we do, Lord. We look to you and 
ultimately we know that our home is in heaven and we're so thankful for that. Father, we pray that you'll be with each of us each day as we live our lives. Help us to always be looking to the fruits of the Spirit. Help us to increase those. Help us to focus on those each day. Help us to especially love one another. Help us to love those who don't love us. Help us to forgive those who sin against us because we know that you forgive us. We're so thankful for Jesus, your son, who died for us. We know that he's sitting at your right hand right now, preparing a place for us, and we're so thankful for that. Father, we just pray that you'll be with us as we continue to worship this morning, and we pray for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love.
I'm not sure that the apostles knew what Jesus was doing when he took the bread and took the wine at the Last Supper and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body, and drink, this is my blood. They had been with him when he fed the 5,000 and the 3,000, but here he was very much alive. And he said, this is my body and my blood. And they were just finishing the Passover dinner. They uh, very shortly deserted him. But you know, uh, Jesus always took something and changed it just a little bit. The Passover supper originated when they took the Passover lamb and they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost to show the angel to pass over that house. But Jesus said, he didn't tell us to take the fruit of the vine and put it on the doorpost. He said, drink it. So what I'm thinking is that we become a little bit part of the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus each time we do this. And we've done it many times. But that is uh, how he changed it. And shortly they would understand that, I think. So let us pray for the bread. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice, for his body that died upon the cross. And we thank, we thank you that we have this opportunity to take this symbol, the bread of his body, that we will do it as often as we come together in, on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. And now for the fruit of the vine. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which to us represents the blood of Christ, that he gave us a new covenant, one that his blood refreshes us and washes our sins continually away. Pray that we partake of this in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Usually at this time we also, in times past, passed a collection basket, but now you have an opportunity to give to the work of the church here at Kingston by placing your offering in a box in the back, or for those who are watching, there's a way to do that online to give it. The work of the church goes on here. We help those who are in need, we spread the word as best we can to those here and across the world. We are very blessed people. Let's give thanks. Father, not only for the blood of Jesus and his body do we give you thanks, but we know that as we live here on this earth, we are a much blessed people. We have our health, we have our prosperity, we have our families, and we pray that as we give back to you for the work of the church here, that we will examine our lives our prosperity, and do so in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before the lesson this morning, we'll sing Paradise Valley. If you would like to, and if it's convenient for you, would you please stand with me as we sing? As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I'm a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toil will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful Paradise Valley by the side of the river of life, 
Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the Paradise Valley, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. As I roam the hillside, or I list to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the dale, a faint picture is there of a land bright and fair, where perennial flowers never fail. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden beneath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that grow in the garden above. In the midst of it grows, share its perfect sweet rose, tis the wonderful flower we love. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Amen. Be seated, please. I appreciate Elliot leading our singing this morning. Amen. Uh, thank, thankful he was here. I know one of the things we sometimes you have <clears throat> everybody out of town or last minute you got to look for somebody and I, I called West End and talked to the preacher Jeremy there I guess Thursday or Friday he was like hey uh, do you have a young guy that can lead singing that maybe can come over and help us and he said I got a guy so appreciate you coming over and helping us this morning and great leading us in worship and thank, thankful for him we had a great uh, day yesterday for those men who got together for the men's breakfast, we had a, a great breakfast together. Sean cooked uh, eggs and bacon and biscuits and all kind of good stuff. We even had fruit for the healthy part of us. Uh, so it was nice. Had a great number of guys show up and appreciate that. And we'll be doing that again for the month of March as we continue to each month try to have that go on. I also want to remind our ladies that we have our ladies retreat coming up uh, this Saturday. And I know that uh, Della and many others have been working hard on this, and if you haven't talked to her yet uh, and made your plans to go, uh, I would strongly encourage you to talk to her because this is going to be a great event for our ladies here at the congregation. I know it will be a wonderful day to study and to pray together and to worship and also have fellowship and, and food. So uh, make sure you talk to her. Make sure you make your plans for that. I told the men yesterday as I was uh, doing a devotional thought at the breakfast that it dawned on me this, this past week that this Sunday marks my one-year anniversary of coming here. I, I remember that actually today, I guess you consider the last day of, of February, was the day I was bringing the U-Haul up and meeting uh, Sean and Ken at the office as I told them I had a few boxes to carry in, and they started complaining because it was more of a U-Haul full of boxes of books. But, uh, but I bring that, was bringing those in, and, and this would have been my first Sunday a year ago. Uh, who would have ever known that after two, two Sundays of preaching, we'd have closed the church down. <laughs> I didn't take too much offense to that, and I never knew that I'd become a TV evangelist, as I say, uh, for the past year uh, of doing online worship and everything. But I am just so thankful and grateful that we're here together today. And it's a good number to see, and I'm, I've been thankful and grateful this past year for the love and support and, uh, uh, of under, un, unusual circumstances 
Yet this church has been uh, great to myself and my family and the love that you've shown. And, uh, and I, I know that God is going to continue to do great things here at this church as we go through this year and years to come. Uh, so thank you guys so much for that time. You know, I was thinking about today and uh, speaking about a topic that's not always a, a easy topic to talk about. The, top, the topic of repentance. And, and when we think about repentance, uh, it can be a, a negative kind of connotation to what we think of man. It's, you really got to be bad and do some bad things in your life to, to think about repentance. You know, as a teenager, <laughs> I remember going to some different youth events. And this one particular youth event that I went to, they had put teenagers up in people's houses. Maybe some of your kids or whatever in, in youth events, you've done that in the past. I learned as a youth minister, I didn't really like that. I'd rather have them in a hotel where I could know where they were at, mainly because of this story I'm about to tell you. Because this one youth event was in Slidell, Louisiana, outside of New Orleans. It's a big youth event. We go, but they'd always put us up in people's houses. And it always became kind of this competition to say, well, you know, we'd get back the next day and say, oh, man, the house I stayed at. They were wealthy. They had a huge mansion, and they fed us uh, five-course men. We'd always try to compare, maybe exaggerate a little bit, to see who had the best house. Well, we got to talking, and, and the three or four of us that always would be putting a house together, me and my buddies, we're going to, oh, we're, we're going to be in a good house. Well, as they started breaking everybody up, and we saw these really nice vehicles pulling up, and everybody in my youth group was getting these nice vehicles, and this little Corolla comes pulling up with smoke blowing out the back. I'm not kidding and this college guy jumps out and says, hey, I think you guys are staying with me. We're like, oh, great. <laughs> so we get in the car. We go to his one-bedroom apartment. He's got a single, a single bed on the floor and a draft table for his college studies. There's no dishes. There's no furniture. He said, well, they told me you guys would be bringing your own bedding. No. We don't have, so we started getting sheets and stuff he had, and we're laying out, and we're like, um, we're hungry. We haven't eaten because the family's supposed to feed us. Oh, well, I don't have anything to eat. He said, but I, I work at a restaurant in the French Quarter in New Orleans, but I don't know if your youth minister would let me take you down there. Oh, yeah, my dad's the preacher. It's okay. You can take us to downtown New Orleans. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah. It'd be good. So we talked this college guy into taking four high school guys down to New Orleans at midnight during the LSU-Alabama football game weekend. And Alabama was having their pep rally down there. Okay? This was a good time. That's why I, I didn't take my kids to places where they put you up in houses. Because I knew what I did. So we go down there, we're walking around, we're having the best time, and now we're going, this is going to be a good story tomorrow. But one of the things that we did that was, it was fairly dumb of us was that we decided that it'd be fun to run by all the bars and stuff that were just blaring the music and all that stuff, and we were yelling stuff like, repent, repent, you know, things like good high school uh, Christian youth people do. And we're yelling these things and getting yelled at and beer thrown at us and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and we... I look at that now and think, what a dummy I was, <laughs> you know? Uh, and needless to say, when our youth minister found out that we gave permission on his behalf, he was not happy with us. We do a lot of stupid things when we're, we're young. And, and in the past, I think about things that I do and think, man, why, why did I do that? But the idea of repentance is, is not so much a, a funny topic to think about. And we can't take it so lightly as we run by and just tell people that, that are living in a world that we deem as worse than ours and say, you better repent. It's not meant to be a, a funny subject. So this morning, I want to give us some thoughts on the, the topic of repentance. Because we can't love God or obey God and still remain the way that we are. It just doesn't work. We have to repent. Uh, becoming a part of the family of God and a Christian takes on an important part of us to repent, to turn 
from what we are and who we are and turn around and, and, and go the opposite direction of a life uh, in the world, living in sin. You know, we don't hear all that much about repentance. And I believe that there are three reasons why that is. Uh, we don't like to talk about it too much or preach too much on that topic. Because I think one is uh, the appeal of modern evangelism is not for repentance, but it's more for enlistment. See, when we seek to bring someone to Christ, quite often our, our methodology is not to call men and women to change their lives and, and to come uh, to God, but rather to join us on Sunday, to, to join the church. Too often the message is, you know, let, let's just solve it. You, you can stay the way you are. Uh, we're, we're not going to pressure you to, to do anything drastically. We just want you to come and to be with us and to worship with us on Sunday. And we'll make no demands of your life. See, our modern evangelism said it like this. We get them first, and then we tell them what it's all about, hoping that if we just get them, then, then we can try to change them over a long period of time without demanding much change in their life. The only problem with this kind of teaching and this kind of thought, brothers and sisters, is that it is unbiblical. It is not uh, the pattern that we see. It's just the opposite of what Jesus said. If you look in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has a, even enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the, soul, uh, for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The result of this no responsibility conversion method is just, uh, it's just easy believism. See, Jesus himself is telling us in these scriptures that we have to carry on cross, that if we're not willing to come to him and, and lay down our lives, even, is he saying, hate your mother, your father, uh, your, your children, your wife? Is he telling them that that's what we've got to do? What he's making a point here is saying, you've got to be so serious about changing your life to dedicate your life to me. I don't want just anybody to come. You know, what's interesting about this passage, by the way, is that up until this time, Jesus had a great following. Up in this time, he had, he had thousands upon thousands that were coming to him and, and following him, that they were saying, oh, we, we believe in you, Jesus. We want to follow you. We want to be what you want us to be. But when he turned around and told people this, and said, if you're not willing to carry your cross, if you're not willing to, to lay down your life, if you're not willing to even leave your parents and those things that are holding you from, from coming and being a part of what I am calling you to, you have no place. You know, after he said this, the Bible talks about how many that, that heard this turned and left because they were not willing to do what Jesus was asking them to do. Jesus is asking us that we've got to be willing to repent, to change our lives, to, to completely give in to what he wants. See, we're actually living in a time when it's never been more popular to be a Christian. 
Uh, it's, it's popular to be a Christian, especially where we live. We live in the Bible Belt, right? Uh, it's, it's nothing for us to be, as I like to call it, and, and others call it, cultural Christians. We have a lot of those who, who are cultural Christians. Uh, they'll, they'll tell you, hey, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. I grew up in a church. My parents uh, are members. My grandparents have been longtime members of this church or that church. And, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. We're, we have no problem even saying, you know, I have no problem on football games. We need to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and, and the National Anthem. And, and, and we need to pray. And we need to put prayer back in schools. And we'll, we'll talk about it because it's popular. It's cultural to be that, especially in the Bible Belt. Oh, but don't, don't expect me to be able to get my kids up on time for church. That, that, I don't really have to go to a church to be a Christian. I don't have to be involved with the body. I don't have to be dedicated or, or well... I'm a, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ, but I don't want to be too involved because that would take too much commitment away from the other areas of my life that are much more important. And we're going to come out and say that. We don't have to. Our actions say it all for us. Is that true repentance? Is that true living, dedicated lives that Jesus Christ has called us to live? Or are we just being cultural? Oh, it's popular. It's, it, it's what we want to do. But is that carrying your cross? Is that, is that hating your father and your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters? Yes, even your own life more than you love me. Because if you're not willing to do that, you cannot be my disciples. That's what Jesus tells us. To the church, churches are, are booming in a lot of places and, and everybody loves those, those feelings and, and it's great. But listen, the message is good news. But for it to be good news, we must understand the bad news. And the bad news is that this, that we are lost in our sins. And some that are believers have, have slumped back into their sinful lives, into their comfortable lives and we need to make some changes. So I believe that's one reason we don't really talk about repentance. The other one is often we are unwilling or unable to accept the reality of personal sin and therefore to accept the need for repentance. We gotta have that, well, not me, not, not me, that, that's kind of what everything is. It's that attitude. Often the same attitude prevails in our personal responsibilities or our actions. We're in the process of writing sin out of existence. Mistakes, stumbles, errors, dropping our guard. You know, but we haven't sinned. Uh, that, that's not my fault. Uh, I haven't sinned. Those are just things that have happened. Brother and sisters, but when we open God's word, he just says... For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When somebody violates God's will, you know what that's called? It's called sin. When we trespass, miss the mark, any kind of sexual immorality, you can try to justify it, call it what you want, it's sin. Homosexuality is sin. Lying, black or white lies, it's sin. Covetousness. When we are consumed with self and the things that we want and, and we focus more on ourselves, that's covetousness. It's called sin. And God says if you live in sin that you can't have part of my kingdom, you can't go to heaven because you've got to change your life. See what I see today. It has become our national pastime to see everything wrong in our lives as someone else's fault. It's hard to let the spotlight of God just shine in our hearts. To let God's spotlight convict us and tell us where we're wrong and what we need to change. Because nothing is, is really our fault. And so it's hard for God to really work in that. And this is nothing new. Adam, what happened? Well, God, this, this woman you gave me. Eve, what happened? Well, it was the serpent who, who fooled me. Aaron, what, what happened? 
You know the people, they, they were set on evil. It was, it was their fault. Saul, what happened? Well, the people wanted to keep the spoils and spare Agag. Today, what happened? Well, it's my wife. It's her fault. My husband, it's, it's his fault. Well, all the things that happened in my life, well, my parents, it was my parents' fault. And on and on, we, we, we like to blame everybody else for our issues, our problems. But sooner or later, folks, if we're going to get serious about our walk with God, we're going to have to stand before him and tell it like it really is and take personal responsibility because God already knows. We have to repent of the sins in our life and change. Third thing is our culture has written sin out of existence. You know, I'm, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Secular humanism is, is doing a number on our culture, and it's even doing a number on our church. I don't think we should look for things to get any better anytime soon. And so therefore, if we think we can make our world some kind of modern utopia by our own wits and abilities, we're destined to fail. And modern life is a picture of that failure. Corporately, individually, we need God. But if we're going to come to God, we've got to come to him on his terms. We've got to come to him on his terms. And we must come to God open and ready to change, ready to do as he wants to do. And the bottom line of Christianity is choice. Bottom line of Christianity is, it is our choice to do that. And the choice is, will you surrender your heart to Jesus? Will you carry your cross? Will you repent of what's going on in your life? Or, or will you just close that door? And that's an intensely personal choice that you have to make. One that only you can decide for yourselves. One that only I can decide for myself. Repentance. Repentance is a process. Brothers, it, brothers, it is a continual process. Just like the whole of our Christian life is. I continually have to, to confess and repent to God of the weaknesses in my life continually. God expects us to make a decision. He will love us. He'll call us with his love. He'll call us with his word. But I've got to continually uh, repent of the things that, that are holding me back and get rid of them. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, if we let the word of God work on us, it may cut to our hearts. <laughs> if we let word God work on us, it may cut us to the core, to, the, to our, our bones, shake us to our bones, maybe even and it change our lives. And I'm going to tell you, change is never easy. You know what the Word says to me? The word says to me, Hackett, you need to get this out of your life. Now, you've got some things that are holding you back that you are allowing to come between your relationship with me and you. And, and, and John, you've got to get rid of those things. You've got to cut them out of your life. Uh, you need to move in a different direction. See, when we're open to the Word, there can be a lot of cutting, a lot of dissecting, as God positions us to be what He wants us to be. Many of you know that already because you're going through that right now. And we'll go through it all of your life because repentance is a lifestyle. Repentance is not an isolated one-time event. It is a way of life. Often we think of repentance. We like to conjure up images of medieval monks in, in, in sackcloth and ashes. When we think of repentance, we think of some kind of Old Testament prophet or some fiery evangelist whose veins are popping out of their head as they're hitting the, the podium and telling you about that. Afraid he's going to have a stroke as he's talking about repentance, shouting it. 
But I'm going to tell you, there's so much more to repentance. We tend to see it as something that someone who's really wicked or unfaithful needs to do. Those who are struggling, those who are deep in some hideous sin. And unfortunately, many times in our church, we, we kind of treat it like that. We say, hey, we're going to sing a song, and if you are worse than the rest of us, we want you to come out in front of everybody and sit here and tell us all your business. Well, we all sit there and go, oh, when every one of us needs to repent and be continue repenting of the things in our lives. So we think of repentance, we, we have this doom and gloom thought. But there are so many what we call white collar things in their life, their sins that are going on. Living in a little house with the picket fence, two and a half kids, two cars, uh, regular churchgoers. There are many of us that need to repent that live in those kind of lives. Repentance is much more than self uh, flagellation or, or self punishment, it's so much more than that. Some folks come to church. Because they, they, they kind of look at, well, it's time for me to get my tongue lashing. Oh, you, you really stepped on my toes today, preacher. Some maybe even want to feel bad for, for an hour. But during the closing prayer, they receive this miraculous car wash of the soul. Right? If all we do is make each other feel guilty, then we're missing the point. In fact, repentance is the very thing that will lead us away from guilt. Repentance is not just regret or deep sorrow for past sins. It's not. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8 through 11. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that letter grieved you, though only for a little while, as it is, I rejoice. Not because, you're grie- not because we're grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. But also what earnestness to clear yourselves what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in this matter. See, godly sorrow is not repentance. It's the catalyst to repentance. It leads you to repentance. Worldly sorrow, well, that brings you death. Because worldly sorrow doesn't compel you to change. It doesn't bring you to repentance. Repentance is something that applies to everyone. But Brother Brother Hackett, I've been a a Christian for 35 plus years. Then you of all people should be living that penitent lifestyle before God. Well, I've been a Christian for three weeks. Well, then repentance has fresh breeze blowing through your life, and you need to keep that. Let it, let it become your lifestyle. See, in the original language, the word of repentance is metanoia. Meta, which means change. Noia means mind. Repentance is the change of our mind. Heart, does your heart hurt? Are tears flowing? Let it get to the mind, and then you're in Repentance. It's not just an emotional event, repentance is. Although emotion is involved. But it's a decision that we make every day to live a certain way before God. To live open to his change in our life. To let God change your mind on a constant basis. I like to say often, uh, God, uh, God will take you wherever you are in your life. He'll take you as you are but he refuses to let you stay there. Closing this morning, repentance has radical implications. It's a fundamental change of your mind. It's, it's your uh, penitence before God that means your life plan is open to God's will in your life and God's guidance. True repentance 
It means your values and your ethics and your actions are all open to what God wants to change and how God wants to move you. That's what repentance is all about. That God comes into your heart and he changes the way we live. He changes the way we walk. He changes the way we talk. He changes our attitude. And ultimately what it means is that a person who has repented before God and lives accordingly begins to have the mind of Christ in them. He begins to view things the way God views things. He begins to take on God's values. And he begins to disdain the things that God disdains. This morning, if you're having trouble with sin in your life, we need to ask the question, have I laid my life down at Jesus' feet? Have I laid my life down at the cross? See, we need to bring our hearts and our minds into what God wants us to be. And so the question is, have I done everything I need to do to lay all my burdens down at the cross? Am I carrying the cross? Am I carrying my burdens and leaving them there and changing my life? Am I changing my mindset? Am I changing my direction? If not, the only thing I can tell you is God requires it. God requires all of us to be repentant in who we are and how we live our lives as Christians. And if we've got sin in our life, we've got to get rid of that sin so we don't have to carry on that guilt. We can be released from it and live for God evermore. And those who don't, well, they're not going to get to share in the benefit of heaven one day. It's that important to who we are as Christians. This morning, if you need to give your life to Christ, you've never taken that first step of being washed with the blood of Christ through baptism, why not do it today? And if you have, and you keep finding yourself going back into your old ways of life and the way the world's, world wants you to live, know today you can change that, but you've got to repent of that, and you've got to give it to God. If you need to do that this morning, do it now as we have our invitation song. Sending a load of care. Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know, my Jesus? Do
You know, thank you so much for uh, leading our, our music today. It was really great to, to hear your voice up here. And John, thank you. I needed that sermon this morning, that uh, repentance. I, I pray twice a day, sometimes more often than that. It's early morning and, and right before I go to bed. And uh, then if I'm having a tough day, I have to find a quiet place somewhere to, to say another prayer. So... Uh, uh, but I always start off my prayers with, Lord, forgive me, for I've sinned. And, and it, uh, you know, it, it always helps me because I, I look for, you know, I've gotten better over the last few years, and especially since I've had the stroke. But, uh, you know, we sin every day. And, and sometimes it, uh, it helps us just to stop and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do I need to be doing for you? And so if you would bear, bow with me this morning as uh, we have those words that John gave us to, to live our life by this upcoming week. And we know there's so many out there hurting, but it's really great to see so many of you out here today as we start to see the building start to fill back up. And uh, we pray for all of those that are online. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys back out here with us very soon. Lord, thank you for this sermon today and thank you so much for all of those that are are here with us and those that are tuned in online. We ask for, we have so many that's in, in need of our prayers and there's so many that we don't even know about that's, uh, that's out there that's, that needs our prayers and our help. Our church does a wonderful job with, uh, with outreach and as John and I were talking this morning, we can feel the, the opportunities for us opening up and uh, as our men gathered uh, yesterday, we, we had some conversation about some of that outreach being uh, being exciting for us as we're able to uh, get out in the community and start doing some different things to help and support. And this church is, has such a loving heart, and I, I thank you for bringing me into this this uh, church and this community and uh, and being able to be a part of that. So be with us as we go this our separate ways today and just help us to be able to reach out to someone if it's just one person this week and touch them and uh, be able to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.